Welcome to the Tom Matt Show. You are walking through the front door of the retirement zone. And now, your host, Tom Matt. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of the Tom Matt Show. Thank you so much for joining us. Going to have a good one coming at you here shortly. Talking about failure and how it's a teachable moment with Judge Rosemary Aquilina. But last week, remember, Sky Bergman was back. Been a minute, been a minute for Sky. Connecting Generations. She just finished a book. She sort of does things backwards. She does a film first. Then she writes a book about right, doing the film. Pretty interesting. But she's a cinematographer, uh, adjunct faculty, retired faculty from Cal Poly, uh, San Luis Obispo. So check that one out. Uh, Lives Well Lived. If you look that up on PBS, you find that film. If you have aging people in your life, which we all do, because we're all growing older, we're not getting old, unless it, unless you want to get old, that's up to you. Check out that movie, Generations Lives Well Lived is the name of the, of the film and the book. All right, today, first timer, although she's a complete veteran, Judge Rosemary Aquilina really doesn't need much introduction. I'm so glad that we crossed paths and became, and we're going to become friends because she's going to be awesome, and she's got such an amazing story, and talk about her history and how she achieved what she's achieved, because as you all know, I love talking about breaking through the glass ceilings, trying new things, getting out there, and being a, being a girl dad. I'm so supportive of females getting out there and just doing their thing, and, and just going for it, just in athletics and academia and professional, everything, all of it. That's how we raised our girls, and that's the way that... The judge has done her thing, and I mean, in spades. <laughs> judge Rosemary Aquilina was elected to the 30th Circuit Court for Ingham County in November of 2008. Now, this is a super long bio because the judge has done a ton in her life, and I'm not going to steal her thunder too much, but because a lot of people know her and her professionality, we're going to talk more about her life and how she achieved what she's doing and the tips that she can give to us. She served at the 55th District Court Judge for four years, during which time she served as chief judge as well as a sobriety court judge. There's a million different things that she's done. She's retired honorably from the Michigan Army National Guard. That's another piece to her amazing story. Just let me tell you this. Yesterday, I watched the judge's TED Talk, and that is a synopsis of what we're going to do right here. I want to welcome to the radio program, my newest friend, Judge Rosemarie Aquilina. Judge, welcome to the show. Don't be offended if I call you Rosie, and I hope nobody, none of the listeners do either. <laughs> How are you? Great. Thank you for having me, and you can call me Rosie. It's interesting because the people who know me, who I grew up with, call me Rosie. Most people call me Rose. Uh, there are a few friends who love the Rosemary, as do I. However, most people, because of the judge role, call me Judge. And everyone says, well, which name do you prefer? I honestly don't care. So call me whatever you will. <laughs> being fearless. I'm going to call this one being fearless, everybody, because Judge Rosemary Aquilina, Rosie, my new best friend, is the most fearless woman that I think I've come across. If ever, and I've come across a lot of very, very influential women in my life. I'm so proud to say that across the board, across the board from Michigan State University, everywhere. Rosie, let's talk about your life a little bit. You know, this is your life. Talk about your family. This first segment, I'm going to give you the rest of the segment to talk about you and your family and where you live. And it's kind of your life story anyway. So let's start with your with your current family. And then we can step in the time machine when we come through to, uh, the rest of the episodes or the rest of the uh, segments. Go right ahead, please. So right now I live with my uh, my mother. My father recently passed. I'm a caregiver to them. And my two dogs, two cats, and my twins, who are 14. I have five children. My oldest are David and Jennifer. They are 41 and 42. And my middle child, Johanna, will be 24 in uh, November. And it's been a journey for me because I'm the mother of five, most of which time I've been a single mom. I was divorced many years ago, had my first two children in law school and was married at the time. And then I got divorced a few years later and then had my middle child when I was 42 and my twins when I was 52. Wow. And everyone thinks I'm a little crazy and maybe I am, but I think there's nothing greater in this world than 
family. And the work that I do and that we'll be talking about is because I want to leave a better world for all of your children and my children, because ultimately you can have whatever possessions you want. You can make as much money as you want, but we can't take it with us, but we leave behind the most precious gift, which is our children and our world needs fixing. So I'm trying to do that. And every time I try to do that, I get knocked down. I don't take no for an answer. I do face my fears. And I always find the back door. If you slap me at the front door, I'm going to find a window or a door and I'm going to go through it. Can you guys see where this episode is going to go? I mean, any way we can climb the mountain, Rosie, any way we can get in through any way, I don't care. I mean, I'm I'm Mr. Non-Traditional, as everybody knows. I've done everything so ass backwards in my life. And still, I'm so grateful to be alive at this point in my life. I'm just glad that we're having this conversation and doing these things. So what an interesting what an interesting um, life you've had with the twins at 14, having your children, your twins at 52 years old. Congratulations on this par- part of your life. That's so wonderful. Well, it's been interesting. Um, you know, there are days that I say, what did I do? <laughs> but I, in my brain, and I don't know about yours, but I, I feel 19. Oh, yeah. And I hope feel 19 until I'm 120. That's the number I keep saying, God, I got to be here till I'm 120. I got a lot of work to do, but my brain tells me I'm 19. So I'm having fun with the journey and it hasn't always been fun, but every challenge uh, is a new opportunity for greater success and learning. And that's what I've done my whole life. And you asked about my early life and probably people are sick of me talking about this. I talked about it in the TED Talk. I've got my memoir that actually Reese Witherspoon said, you've got to write this. And so I did. And really, I was born in Munich, Germany to a Maltese father and a German mother. And my grandparents had emigrated when my dad and his siblings were adults uh, to the United States. He served in the U.S. Army and then went to medical school on the GI Bill. Met my mother on a train. They were married a year later. I was born. My brother was born. He couldn't study with two crying babies. So we emigrated to the United States. I came over stateless. And so did my brother because the United States, although my father was a citizen, he had not served for 10 years and he could not pass down his citizenship. My mother at that time, Germany only recognized the citizenship of the father. So we had no country. We had no place. We became naturalized when we were about 10 and 11 years old. And so I really feel like my fight was from the day I was born and called stateless. And, you know, the laws have since changed. I would have been a citizen now because my father was a citizen. But it really, I think, set a path of my journey that you're going to be a fighter for every single thing, including your country. So when my father was studying. He could not come to the United States. We were very, very poor. And I saw him maybe once a year. I didn't know he was my dad. And my grandparents, I spent most of my time with them. Nanu and Nana, the words for grandfather and grandmother. And so I thought they were my grandparents or my grandparents were my parents. Rosie, let's leave it there. J- Judge Rosemarie Aquilina is our guest today. That's a great jumping off spot because I that, that part of, and this is in your TED Talk, which is very well done. I mean, it was amazing. And I saw the whole thing yesterday. We're going to go into this in a deep dive when we come back. Again, so glad to have Judge Ro- Rosemarie Aquilina being fearless. This woman has done it all. And we're going to talk about as much as we can in this episode, because I guarantee you, that I'm going to want her to come back and and be a guest and be a regular with us and share her wisdom and knowledge because that's what we're here for. We're here to inspire and help people grow and get better. You're listening to The Tom Matt Show, calling this one Being Fearless with my new best friend, Judge Rosemary Aquilina. So glad that you are with us today, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. This is The Tom Matt Show. This segment of the Tom Matt Show is brought to you in part by the Source of Light and Power by band leader Archibald and broadcaster Mitch Anderson. Hear the sound that is endorsed by Odyssey headphones, linear tube audio, RME converters, and Paluso microphones at sourceoflightandpower.bandcamp.com.
Welcome to the Tom Matt Show. Welcome back, everybody, to the Tom Matt Show. This week's episode, Judge Rosemary Aquilina being fearless. Can't wait to get back to this one. But before we do that, i got to remind you, segment two of our radio program is sponsored by Craig, 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 Craig Stiles, Ameriprise Financial. Our, our, our Ameriprise Financial Advisor has all of our refirement zone savings. Remember, it's not about retirement. It's about refirement. That's a choice you can make. Craig and I talk about this all the time. If you're going to have an active refirement in your life as you continually to grow older, you got to have somebody managing your money. Craig's our guy. I mean, he's we have all of our savings, and I've said this many times, all of our refirement zone savings is with Ameriprise Financial Advisor. And I hope you can get with Ameriprise because our Ameriprise Financial Advisor and yours, Craig Stiles, can help you plan for the life you want today and well into the future. With the right financial advisor, Bism life can be brilliant. Call Craig, please, 1-800-528-1355. His local number is 517-483-4893. Email Craig.styles at ampf.com. Offices are located at 2651 Coolidge Road, Suite 103, East Lansing, Michigan, 48823. Again, Craig Styles is the creator of Desideri Analytics, his proprietary algorithm that he's had for over 20 years. He actually allowed a senior student that a friend of mine, very, very good friend of mine, Anya Gerstenberg, to uh, do her senior cognate on on Desideri Analytics and the algorithm, and she four-pointed that. And that's the thing about Craig. He's a giver, and to have a young person do an 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 analyzation of his algorithm from young perspective is really interesting, and it went very, very well, obviously, as she got a four-point on that. I want to thank the radio stations that have carried us and carry us now and in the future and in the past, WGHN 92.1 FM Grand Haven, Michigan, WGIM 1240 AM Lansing, Michigan's the flagship of the Michigan Talk Network. Thanks to... Steve and Ivy Gruber, which we're very grateful to them for carrying us on to the syndication on the Michigan Talk Network, WGRW 1340 AM in Grand Rapids, WKLQ 1490 Muskegon Whitehall, WIPV FM 94.5 Mackinac City. There's a whole lot of stations in the Michigan Talk Network. But lastly, I'd like to say thank you to Michigan State University and WKAR for carrying us on Sundays at 5 p.m. AM 870 and simulcast at 102.3 FM on the FM dial in East Lansing, Michigan, go green. Once again, I want to thank Craig Styles for helping us doing what he does. He was, he was the first sponsor to ever believe in what we're doing years and years and years ago. And we hope that you get a hold of him. Remember, you can find all of our sponsors on our website, TomMatShow.com. There are all the banners are at the bottom there. I'll tell you about that later. Okay. Today, being fearless, love this topic with my new friend, Judge Rosemary Aquilina, Rosie, being fearless is, is her in her DNA. It's part of who she is, and that's why she's going to be coming on the radio program to help men and women, women and men, understand that you can do whatever you want to do in this life. I mean, and that's, we come from similar backgrounds. Okay, so Rosie, let's get back to the story here because you're talking about your early childhood and how it formed you into the fighter that you are, how resilient you are with your um, with your with your parents and your dad going into med school and two children. And please continue that thread. So my grandparents did everything for me and children. What I have learned from all of this through my life is that you really need to have a talk with your children at every age, explain things to them. I was not explained. And I was told, well, I was a stupid child because I should have known that my parents were my parents and my grandparents were my grandparents. Well, Children learn from the surroundings. And my grandparents did everything for me. I had uncles who were calling them ma and pa. I thought they were my mom and dad. So when my dad comes home from medical school and we are packed in a car, my brother and I and my mother, and all my things are there, I feel kidnapped. No one has explained to me through this whole time. I was now about four or five years old. I was ready for kindergarten. And we drove away and I felt kidnapped. Now, this isn't just a feeling that you can explain, oh, well, you were wrong. Here's the real story. That feeling of being kidnapped has been a feeling, a trauma for my whole life. 
And as much as I tried to explain that to my parents, they said, you know, you're just a stupid child. You should have known. How could you not know? Well, look at the world around us. A lot of things are happening because people thought people knew or should have known or should have said something. So I've always over explained things to my kids. I know they don't like that, but there's a reason for that. And and then as a result, I became a naysayer. Whatever my parents wanted me to do, I said no. And we had a lot of fights growing up. And I have great parents, you know, in their old age. I'm the oldest. I'm the one who's living with them, taking care of them. My siblings chip in, but you know, it's not that I don't love them. It's that I have turned, I flipped the script to positivity because we all need to do that to live properly. And I've said, and in my head, I now own that I have two sets of parents, my grandparents and my parents. And that has really been a journey for me and set in stone that everything that I would do would be a fight, including my father, who was a doctor, thinking I would go to medical school. My brothers are doctors. There's no way any of you want me to be a doctor. I wanted to be a writer. He said no. I said yes. Eventually, I looked him in the eye and said, I'm fine. I'm going to law school. And that's because doctors generally hate lawyers. So it was really a screw you to him. And it was has been a terrific career for me and my writing. I never gave up my dream of writing. I, I've five books published. I have a couple more on the way and hopefully many more. It's what I like to do. It is my passion, but I also am passionate about being a lawyer, about helping people, about being a judge. So it has served me well. The next battle I had after I went to uh, law school and got married, actually, uh, people would say, my husband and I would go out to dinner with friends and they would say, well, what are you going to do after law school? And I'd say, be a lawyer. Well, then what? Be a judge. And then my husband would say, why did you have to say that? And I said, because they asked. And that's the truth. And clearly, he's no longer my husband. He's good for someone else, but not for me. If you can't support the one you love, find someone else. Or if you're not supported, find someone else. So uh, everything has been a journey. Um, When I was pregnant in law school, I would stand up big bellied. My professors would never call on me again until I was no longer pregnant because apparently pregnant women are stupid. So again, another journey. Most of my professors in law school, all but one, were male. There were very few women in my class when I went to law school. So the next journey is getting my first job, which we'll talk about in a minute. We will. Well, thank you for that segue because we're coming back to these stories. This is a whole thing, everybody. I'm, you're not going to hear me. And this is unusual for me, Rosie, because Judge Rosemarie Aquilina is our guest today. Unusual for me because I'm usually the motor mouth, but I love listening to your story because it's so compelling and it's just so real. And it's like that quick story you told about feeling kidnapped at five years old and still carrying those feelings. So many people need... This is why mental health advocacy is one of my biggest topics on this radio program, Judge, because it's just important to get to the bottom. What you've done is you've peeled back your layers. You understand you, and that's that's the biggest thing for people in this world is, for me, I needed to understand me and get through my problems. You've obviously done the same thing. That's what we're doing here with our show, and that's why having you on and being fearless with Judge Rosemary Aquilina is our theme today. You're listening to The Tom Matt Show. Thank you again to our segment two sponsor, Craig Stiles of Ameriprise Financial. For more information on services provided by Craig, please visit AmeriprizeAdvisors.com slash Craig dot Stiles or by calling 517-483-4893. You're tuned in to The Tom Matt Show. Welcome to The Tom Matt Show. Third segment of The Tom Matt Show is sponsored by Jamie White. Great guy. Uh, unbelievable. If you haven't heard the first episode that I recorded with Jamie and he told his story of why he became a lawyer and get, got into the law game from back in the 70s when he was a kid and there was a confrontation with his dad and he's got an interracial couple, his family, and it was one of those things where you had these these bigots that were picking on people and beating up on people and it was very traumatic for him. That's why you want to listen to that ra- that episode of the radio program, Jamie White's first episode. That is why he's a sponsor for our show. White Law, PLLC, is where justice meets compassion, like that, like that tagline a lot. White Law is our advocate in times of need. They're here to help us. 
just like the judge is, Judge Rosemary Aquilina, our guest today is there. They're there to help, listen, support, and fight for what you deserve. And if, if they don't, then you need to find some new friends. Contact White Law today for your free, free, free consultation, whitelawpllc.com. Again, bottom of our homepage, tommatshow.com. You can find and click right through to Jamie's website, which is unbelievably nice. Great website. Very, very functional. Very user-friendly. Um, instant chat boxes, all kinds of cool stuff. Very easy to navigate. Or you can do the old-fashioned way. Just call 517 777 9785 517 777 9785. Look forward to having Jamie come back. He does his quarterly visits with us and hearing about his hunting stories and how he decompresses. And just the story of, of my smart, smart friends are so I, I never know where we're going to go with these things. Just like today's episode with Judge Rosemary Aquilina, Rosie, my friend, being fearless. All right. So Judge, let's step back before you, um, before you're pregnant with one of your children. I don't know if it was the first one or the second one while you were in law school, but the undergraduate program, let's start there. Did you have, and back in those days, how have things changed and encouraging young women now, because I'm, again, as I've said, a girl dad, and I'm always supporting young women and I coach a lot of women. It's like, how have things changed from then till now? And then what tips would you give to these young women um, in, in the undergraduate phase, and then we'll talk about graduate school once we get done with that. What what kind of tips would you give to the young women that you've come across? Because you obviously, obviously, we haven't talked about the Nasser case at all yet, but obviously your name is pretty well known out there. You're very connected with, with the young women out there. What is your advice to young women? When I was in undergrad, I was told, well, you probably shouldn't walk alone at night. Maybe somebody will walk you. The same problems that exist today at Michigan State existed when I was in undergrad in the 70s. And, but they weren't talked about. And we didn't have the resources. And I was very unaware. I knew in my head, stay away from drugs. There were a lot of drugs. There was a lot of drinking. I knew that I didn't want to compromise my mental ability in any way. I wanted to always be whole and present because without that, I felt less than and I don't like feeling less than. So I stayed away from those things. Uh, I did that on my own because of who I am, because I wanted to succeed, because I didn't want anything like that to bring me down. I think that today things haven't changed much. And certainly we have the opportunity for cameras. We have the opportunity for education about sexual assault, about, yes, get somebody to walk. You don't walk alone. Don't walk with strangers. Don't walk with earbuds. We didn't have those in the seventies, but we had other things. We carried loud music and we, you know, were pretty fearless about where we we're going to walk on campus. And we should have had that fear because there were a lot of rapes in campus and there still are, there are still a lot of problems. I think the advice that I would have is to be open about what's happening. Talk to people. Don't be afraid to speak up. If you see someone being bullied, if you think that you're in an all female dorm and there's men there and they shouldn't be there, speak up. It's okay to not follow the crowd, to have somebody say, well, you're a narc. You're, you tell on us, we don't like you. That's okay because we always have to think about safety first and speaking up for others. Every single time, you speak up. There is somebody else who wanted to say it, but was not able to. And this generation has lost the ability to really speak up. They speak through technology. And I'm seeing that loss as a professor, as a judge, as a mom. And I feel like I had that loss in college and undergrad because we didn't have the intuitiveness, the training. We weren't allowed to talk about sex and other things very openly. And we should be talking about those things. Because we all have body parts. We're all sexual people. There's crime all around us. There are good people and bad people. And we have to have these conversations for the safety of the rest of our life. When you said the line, feeling less than judge, I'd like you to kind of think about expanding on that because that's a, that's a feeling that kind of resonated with me. I'm not exactly sure why, but because, you know, as you get put down and pushed down and kept down. Can you expand on that a little bit for the young people that are out there, men and women, women and men, feeling less than and how they can avoid feeling less than? Yeah, 
feeling less than is when someone really bullies you or taunts you into taking another drink, using drugs, uh, wearing something that you might not want to, going somewhere you might not want to. And they make you feel like somehow you are wrong, that you are less than they are. And actually, when you keep your your power and you say, no, this is what I choose to do, you actually keep your power. You are more than. You own who you are. When you are less than, someone else is usurping who you are. You become their follower. You should always be the leader in your life. And then you are more than. You should not compromise yourself. When you feel less than, you're compromising something that you hold important because someone else has told you something and you feel they're more important. Well, that's wrong. You are the most important person in your life. You drive the bus. You own the bus. Don't let somebody else drive your bus. That's such great wisdom. Thank you for saying that. I mean, you are in charge of your own bus. So as we move forward in your life and you get through this undergraduate thing and you've already rocked the boat a little bit because, you know, your dad wants you to go to medical school and you want to be a writer and you're going to do this and you're obviously strong-willed. So- you get through the undergrad and then you decide to go to law school and you started to tell this in the, in the pr- previous segment about the threat of being pregnant, standing up and they wouldn't call on you. I mean, that had to be really rough. I mean, all male professors, then they wouldn't call on you when you were, you know, when you were pregnant. I mean, we got a couple minutes to go before we uh, end this segment here and we can always finish this thread. But can you can you continue that whole conversation about graduate school and going to law school and that, all that decision making? Because those play into be with young people now very, very much so, especially with money. So let me start out something I really want to say that I say when I talk to students and I go on campuses all over and talk. I got married between law, uh, um, undergrad and law school. I would not have done that again. When you go to grad school, when you're in college, you know, when you graduate from high school, you're a different person than when you entered high school. When you graduate from college, you're a different person. You graduate from law school, you are, again, a different person. When you get married, it is really hard to then stay that same person that you married to. And so the divorce rate is astronomical. Don't get married until you're in your career and you know who you are and you can find the right mate. But ultimately, I did get married. Because for me, it was timing and I had my journey and I had it planned in my head and no one was going to stop me, not my father, not anyone. I got married. I had two babies in law school. I was treated differently when I was pregnant by the professors. And in fact, when I was not pregnant, I lost my weight fairly quickly. And one of the professors, as I was sitting outside of the law building and having a Coke, came up to me. And bent down and whispered in my ear, how does it feel to have all the men looking at you again? And I was so stunned. I didn't say anything. And I just thought, you know, now my older self, I would have reported him to the dean. Things have changed tremendously. And so if we don't understand where we have been, we we will never understand where we where we are going. I mean, we didn't just arrive here through a, a time machine. And... Hearing the judge's story, we'll come back. We'll finish this threat. I knew that going through the undergrad and the graduate work, because there's always, always story behind the story. Being fearless, Judge Rosemarie Aquilina, my new best friend. Rosie, we will be right back. You're listening to The Tom Matt Show. Thank you again to our segment three sponsor, White Law PLLC, where justice meets compassion. White Law is your advocate in times of need. We are here to listen, support, and fight for what you deserve. Contact White Law today for your free consultation. Visit us at whitelawpllc.com or call 517-777-9785. This is The Tom Matt Show. Welcome to The Tom Matt Show. Fourth segment of the Tom Matt Show is sponsored by Brock, 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 Brock Fletcher, selling team of Keller Williams Realty. Trust is his middle name. Phone numbers, 517-853-6408. That's the office. Or the super secret, not so super secret, Brock's personal number. And this is the one you want, 517-303-3262, 517-303-3262. You can go online to kwsellingteam.com. You can go on our website, as I've said a couple of times now, tommatshow.com, the bottom of the homepage, and you can click right on through to those, through the banners and get to our, get to our friends. Most, most 
real estate companies spend very minor amounts of money on marketing. Brock Fletcher invests way before he ever gets your business. And remember the story I've told you about my neighbor next door who needed some advice before he sold his house, Mike. He, we, he was my neighbor for a couple of years, young couple, just had a baby, got a new job, needed it, needed to sell his house quickly because it was the, during COVID and all these things. And he told me how much he wanted for his house. And I said, you know, I think you're a little light on that number, um, but I don't know. But I know the guy that will know. And so I gave him Brock's number. And I had no idea. That's all That's all that was said. And I've told this story before, and this is actually true, true, true story. Next thing I know, there's a sign in his yard with Brock's company, the selling team of Keller Williams. And a week later, house is sold. Got him 20 grand more than he was telling me that he wanted. And that's a true story. I mean, that's just the way it works. You got to go with educated people. Find people, even if you want to call Brock or listen to some of the podcasts that we've done that are on the website. There's like 15 or 20 of them. I don't even know. A bunch. Go listen to those episodes because he'll have questions. We'll talk about all kinds of things about life, real estate, business, upsizing, downsizing, all that kind of stuff. Those are the kind of questions you want to ask these Brock is really cool about not only hiring young people, people that are in transitions in their retirement zone for new new careers, whatever, but he's also just a great wealth of information and knowledge. And that's why you want to get to know Brock Fletcher. Coolest guy ever. He's a Spartan through and through and can't wait to talk to him about football season because the guy is just like a diehard. He'll 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 be He'll be glad to know that I have Darian Harris coming on the show here next week. And so we're going to be talking some football here next week. So that back to this today's episode, though, being fearless, Rosemary Judge, Rosemary Aquilina, Rosie. So thank you for allowing me to call you Rosie, Rosie. It's, uh, it's nice to make new friends. You're telling the story now. Your life story is so interesting, and it's so long, and, and it's just um, – just, just so many variables that have gone into your life. But you're in, you're in uh, the, the previous segment, close of that, and that thread that we want to pick up on. If when you're, you've had your baby and you're in, you're in law school. And I knew this talking about school was going to be interesting. You have a professor come up. Please, for people that just joined us, can you recap that? We'll just continue on with that thread. Sure. I, I'm sitting down and this professor comes to me and bends over and whispers in my ear, how does it feel to have all the men looking at you again? And I was literally dumbfounded. And then he walked away and I froze. I've never forgotten it. And my older self would have said, tell the dean, tell the dean now. (laughs) But it wasn't done in those days. And it didn't even occur to me. I'd had no conversations or training about that. He didn't touch me. He just said this really raunchy thing to me and in this voice that was horrifying. And, you know, I've thought about it over the years and I've thought, I wish I would have said something. How many women did he do that to? Unbelievable that that you had to tolerate that kind of thing. But that's, that was normal. Unfortunately, those days, racism, sexism, all of these things, they were just taken for granted. That's what I'm talking about with some of and stepping up and, and speaking and telling your truth, because it's if we don't understand where we came from, if people don't hear this story, they say, well, it's, it's always been this way. No, it hasn't. It hasn't been this way. It's, it, everything is a, is a normal progression and evolution hopefully at least we learn, we continue to learn. What are some of the other things that came along in your career? You you did, you went into the military, you got a 20 year career in the military. I'm curious to see how, how that came to be because, and you had a, a cool story from the Ted talk on that one too. So can you, let's, let's, let's shift gears here from the academia side of things of the judge, judge Rosemary Aquilina's life and being fearless to the military side of things. What, what possessed you and tell us some of that that part of your life, please. Yeah. So my uncle Chuck was on the USS Bainbridge. And when, when I was a small child and he would come home to Nunu and Nunna's house, he would be in this really cool uniform. And he always brought me some toy from around the world. And my brother and I didn't have many toys. We were very poor. And so I just thought this is the coolest thing ever. And then there were pictures of my father who was in the, had been in the U S army in his cool military uniform. So from a very young age, you know, I was a couple of years old. I thought 
I got to wear those uniforms. I got to be in the military. And so I always, I never said anything about it. It was just something that was on my bucket list. So when I was in high school and they had those career days, I went to Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. And all my friends said, that's just you, Aquilina, always making trouble. I said, no, that's, I'm going to do this. And everyone said, yeah, no. And, you know, they're going to doctor, nurse, teacher, whatever. And I just stuck with the military. And then I went to college and I did not do ROTC because I thought, you know what, I don't know what exactly is going to happen in my life, but no one's going to make me contractually obligated to something if I change my mind. So I always had it in my head to go. So I got married. I you know, went to law school and I was waiting for bar results. And a couple of things happened. One is I started applying for the military. And two is I applied for a job in the Senate. I had an interview with a senator and I was waiting, waiting, waiting. I get the news back that I've passed the bar. I call him. I'm waiting for this job. Interview went really well. And I call him back and I make an appointment. And literally everyone, my parents, my friends, my husband said, what are you doing? How can you call a senator? And I said, what have I got to lose? Either I have the job or I don't. I have nothing to lose. So I call I tell the senator, either I've got the job or I don't. You need to make a decision. I'm getting other offers. And he said, you're hired. I go to work and he says, um, you know, I, I said, why did you make me wait? And he says, well, because you have to work with men. And I needed to make sure that you would be able to do that and hold your own. When you called me, I knew that you would be able to do that. He was also, and he said to me, what else do you have going on in your life? besides your family. And I said, I'm joining the military. And oddly enough, you know, God puts you in certain places. He was already in the National Guard. And I had signed up for the Navy. And the Navy says to me, you have to travel the world for two years. And I said, I can't do that. I'm a mom. Sorry, not joining. But so then I had joined the the National Guard. I had filled out the paperwork. And he said, that's great. I'm in. No problem. So it was fabulous until I had to wait a year and a half to get in and my paperwork, my physical, everything was in order. And I kept saying, where's, you know, where's the swearing in? What's going on? And I find out through the senator who was drilling and asking what's going on, that my paperwork is on the corner of a colonel's desk because I was a woman. And so I said, well, that's okay. I'll just volunteer. And so I put on my tightest jeans. And I do mean like Elvis Presley style jeans, really tight. And cowboy boots, because it's my favorite thing to wear. And I wore a reasonable shirt. And I showed up to volunteer. And the colonel was happy. There was a backlog of work. And then I made sure I had coffee where the general does. And we were on the second floor at that time, went down to the first floor. and. I talked to everybody. When I talked to the general, I talked to the colonels. I introduced myself around and was just kind of that bubbly, you know, here I am. And by the time I got upstairs with my coffee, the colonel was holding the phone, pointing at me and the phone, and he's holding it out so that I can hear the general yelling at him. Who is that woman? And the general explains, wow, she's volunteering. She's going to be our next JAG. The paperwork's done. He says, get that woman in a uniform. I was sworn in the very next weekend. The general crossed out six years, put eight. I said, please put 20. I will stay. He swears me in. And the next thing he says to me, and I love this general and he's passed now. And he's he's a fantastic person. But these were, again, those times. And he said to me, the only thing that would have been better, Aquilina, because this is when I learned that I'm the first female. I didn't realize I was the first female jet. The only thing that would have been better is if you were black. And we will hold it at that thought right now because we're going to come up on break. And I just, I was waiting so patiently here. I love this story. Being fearless, Judge Rosemary Aquilina, you are listening to The Tom Matt Show. Come back, join us for the finish of that story. We'll be right back. Thank you again to our segment four sponsor, Brock Fletcher, real estate agent at the selling team with Keller Williams Realty. For more information on services provided by Brock, please call his personal cell phone at 517-303-3262. 
or by emailing brock at kwsellingteam.com. This is the Tom Matt Show. Welcome to the Tom Matt Show. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the Tom Matt Show. Our website, TomMattShow.com, TomMattShow.com, TomMattShow.com. Please go there. If you have any questions, you want to contact our sponsors, as I've said m- multiple times during this episode, and I will always, please go down to the bottom of the homepage, and you can find all of our sponsors and friends who we trust and we adore, and we want you to help them help us. So please utilize our sponsors from Craig, 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 at Ameriprise, to Jamie, Jamie, Jamie White, at White Law, PLLC, to Brock Fletcher, at the selling team of Keller Williams, and all of our other friends out there. Please help them because they do help us. Without them, without you going to their businesses, they cannot help support us. Judge, how would you like to have people connect with you, speaking engagements, books, whatever you'd like to talk about? Please go ahead, promote whatever you'd like. So I'm representing. Yeah, I'm represented by Creative Artists Agency. They can reach out to them. They can also contact my office. I am have a email. My personal email is authoraquilina at gmail.com or work is raquilina at ingham.org. I have a website that's being worked on right now, but it should be up shortly. It's aquilinawarriors.com. I have a number of products. I have affirmation playing cards for various uh, uh for children, for adults, for positivity. I have um, puzzles for healing, for trauma, sexual assault, uh, divorce, all sorts of things like that. I have a number of books, Just Watch Me, My Memoir, All Rise, Triple Cross Killer, Feel No Evil, My Thrillers, a couple more are coming out. And I just broke a a new book, which has created a new genre called, um, I reverse here, but uh, car wash art and daily affirmations. I go through car washes. I take pictures and put affirmations and it's just a fun little hobby, but people are really enjoying it. So I have a lot of products. I have a lot of things. I do speaking engagements all over the world. If you need a speaker, I'm there for you. I also, if you read my books, whether it's on Zoom because of distance or in our general area, I'm happy to talk to book clubs. Love doing that. We have great fun, just like we're having today. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, my pleasure. It's been a it's been a joy, and we're going to tie things together because we're finishing the thread of your um, career in the in the military, twenty years of career there, and how that helped perpetuate your um, your time on on the bench. And so, but let's. Let's finish that thread with the how that led into so many of the very famous cases that you've dealt with, including the Nasser case, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But how did all of that lead into where you are now? So I didn't know that I was the first female JAG, and I ultimately then became the person who handled all the delicate cases. All the minorities came to me. Um, I was given duties sometimes because the it was you know, beneath the men, or it was a project, oh, I didn't want to give it to the men. It was because of rank or being a woman or whatever. Um, I have to say though, the military was the best job ever because I was really not treated like a woman overall. I was treated like a fine piece of a machine. And because we all work based on duty and rank and all of that. And I just had a terribly interesting career, I think, in the military. But it really taught me to Figure out the backstory when you work on a mission or you work on a case, you've got to understand the lay of the land. And so that has carried me in my law practice and being a judge. So I've, I've learned to ask, what would you like me to know and how can I help? And you saw that in the Nasser case, uh, but that was a case where everyone said, oh, you just did that then. No, nope. I handled that case exactly like I handled every case since I was a district court judge. Lawyers would get mad at me. Uh, the prosecutor wanted their people back. The sheriff wanted people back. Uh, attorneys wanted to go back to their office. But I would talk to people and find out the backstory and talk to them about how they can do better or you know what were their needs because it's the power of the robe. Your mother might tell you something, your husband, your your boyfriend, whatever. But when you hear it from somebody in authority, sometimes it resonates, and I think that's terribly interesting because. 
a huge part of my job. It's not putting people in jail and prison. It is rehabilitation. I can only do it if I understand the backstory, if I understand what caused you to become in front of a judge, what caused you to use drugs, to check out a life, to break into a store, to hold someone at gunpoint. There has to be a backstory. There has to be a reason. So I've always asked that. I've tried to rehabilitate people from whatever trauma has driven them to commit whatever crime is in front of me. And it's worked very, very well. I did that in sobriety court. I run into people all the time who say, you saved my life. My son has a healthy child and good marriage because of you. It's really not because of me. It's because I opened their door of fear, helped them walk through it, rehabilitated them with tools that they had to do the hard work. They had to learn those lessons so they could then live their life. And that's how I've tried to live my life, push past the fear, figure out what's what's going on and how I can do that. But helping others is a true joy. And that's really what happened in the Nasser case. It just opened the door. The bravery, what happened was solely credited, should be solely credited to those sister survivors who stood up and said, you hurt me. And I'm I'm not a number, I'm a name. And they told that publicly and one girl led to the next, led to the next, because there were so very few who wanted to put their name out there, who wanted to come in front of me. And when I said I will allow everybody, because I do not see the Crime Victims' Rights Act as only the victim, because crime doesn't have any borders. And I know from being a judge uh, many years before the Nasser case, that when I uh, let other people speak, like when there's an armed robbery in a house, And not everybody's home, but when the family comes home and they learn what happened, they can't sleep. And they tell me about that. And they tell me where to sell our house. You can see that it's important that they publicly say what happened and they start to heal. And it really helps me decide what needs to happen to the defendant, how I can help the victims, how I can help the defendant, how we can solve these problems. And that's what you saw in the Nasser case. Uh, That's why I let everybody speak. And the doctors who referred him patients, the parents, the girls. So I listened to 169 people. I would have listened. Um, I listened for seven days. I would have listened for 70 days if I needed to, because it is important to realize that the only case in front of me is that case. I have a huge jacket, but what's important are those people in that case in that moment. And that's what I did. Judge, how do you compartmentalize that in your life when you go through seven days of listening to all of those very, very hard stories. How do you compartmentalize that as a professional? And because you could have doctors, you could have lawyers, you could have judges. I mean, is there a tip? Is there a special secret sauce to that? How do you, how do you handle that? That's interesting because I, I think a hundred percent of people who've ever interviewed me has, have asked that, but I, I have to ask you a question back. And that is, if you go to the emergency room and you've been working out in the yard and your arm is hanging off and the doctor cries, do you want that doctor? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. And so I do a lot of things. You know, I write, I paint, I show, I create these cat toys. I do so many things. I cook. I had a cooking, um, uh, you can find my cooking on YouTube and it was in Scene Magazine. I had a column for about 14 months before COVID. There's a lot of things that I do to keep my brain and my emotions where they're supposed to be. But I have to say with the Nasser case and with so many other cases, The strength of the victim actually empowers me. It strengthens me. And when they told their story and then the next girl and the next girl came and you see that they grow from someone who's very afraid, almost like a small child, and they just empower themselves. They empower me. It's like being handed a new baby. You have that euphoria of this new baby and you forget the pain. So as I listen to victims, as we engage and I see them, morph into a stronger person, it empowers me to go forward. I don't feel sad. I don't carry that. I do my job. I do it well. And I don't worry about it. What's the takeaway? We've got a minute to go here, Judge. Judge Rosemary Aquilina has been our guest. Thank you for that synopsis. That was great. What's the takeaway? Because I could I could go on and on and we could have another two-hour conversation on this, just on that topic alone. And we will. But what would be your takeaway from today's episode? Really good <laughs> question. Um, Own who you are, 
be authentic and you will always uh, go to higher ground. I like it because you know what? Here are two quotes I wanted to save for you guys. And I got a minute for you to comment on this as well. From your TED Talk, which I would encourage everyone to go check out the judges TED Talk. We'll put that link in the recap when we when we have up the uh, the podcast, everybody. But there are two quotes that I pulled from your TED Talk yesterday, Judge. Failure is a teachable moment in your life. I hope I got that correctly. Failure is a teachable moment in your life. And secondly, being fearless is contagious. Would you please comment on those two quotes from your TED Talk? I hope I got them right. You got them right. Yes. Every single time you fail, you have to look at how, why did I fail? Okay. E- examine it and then say, I'm going to do better next time. I'm going to change this little thing. And then the next time you do succeed, that is how Colonel Sanders became Kentucky Fried Chicken. You know, he reinvented that recipe so many times. And for me, he's been motivational to me because that's been that mantra where you can fail, but you know what? You succeed the next time and the next time. Every little step you take forward is a success, even if it's a failure. The only failure is in stopping. And then um, I don't remember what was the other quote you pulled. Being fearless is contagious. It's contagious because when people see me succeed and I get letters from all over the world saying, you did it, I'm going to do it. You are my motivator. So people around you will also want to be fearless. They will want to be you. And I always tell people, be yourself, don't be me. She is Judge Rosemary Aquilina, being fearless. If our show fits your business or group's mission, we want to be of service to you. Always remember, always, always remember. Before you can share love with others, you must love yourself first. Thanks again to Judge Rosemarie Aquilina. Rosie, thank you for being with me today. Thank you for having me. I'll look forward to the next time. That'll be great. Sandy, Craig, Brock, Jamie, we will talk to everybody next weekend. Have a great week. Go out and ignite your life. Remember, Tom Matt Show is a production of Boomers Rock Media. We want to bring your story to life. Lastly, I want to thank Mitch Anderson and Vanessa, my virtual assistant, for doing what they do. Thank you so much, everybody. We are out. The Tom Matt Show is produced by Mitch Anderson of Black Circle Studios. Original music from the source of light and power by the Ark of All.